The first thing I should say is that I don't, I try not to get jealous of other people's writing, and I'm pretty good about it. There's some really good people here. Oliver, Charles Mann, the wonderful books are written, and I get very excited. Every time I read something you write, I just want to throw it at the wall and say, why could I not have done that? <laughs> because you're so insightful. And like the great historians, food, agriculture, those things are jumping off points to a much more diverse intellectual discussion. So let's try to use it as a jumping off point. We don't have super long, but we have a little time. Do you think, whatever period of time you want to call the modern era of agriculture, let's say after World War II, just I'm making that up, um, are we doing better? And I'm not just talking about feeding people. I'm not just talking about getting calories out there into the world. I'm talking about the things we know are problems. I would, oh, several points to that. First, um, I think modern agriculture begins before that. I think it begins in the late 18th century when you begin to get mechanization. It really takes off in the 19th century with fossil fuels, so I'd make it a longer period. Um, second, I would say that from my focus has been, although I grew up on a farm, my focus has been very much on trying to open up a space because I keep reading discussions about uh, food production or feeding the world and it ends at the farm gate. And actually there is far more work and energy that goes into things after the farm gate than before the farm gate. And so most of my work has been trying to look at how we turn uh, plants and carcasses into food. And I try to use food for what is actually something edible. But to go back to your point about modern agriculture, it has a, obviously a dreadful reputation in the United States, and there are lots of reasons why. I live right near the Black Earth Prairie in uh, Texas, which was, you know, it's some of the richest soil in the world. And now it's just lying there. Um, it, three generations of cotton more or less destroyed it. So there are really difficult problems um, about uh, modern agriculture, but, uh, n you know, we're learning. I mean, we're learning fast. It's but do you think we're, we are in danger of moving backwards a bit? I live in the Hudson Valley, which is connected by an underground railroad to the Bay Area, where <laughs> everyone, and in both places, it's just $35 chickens and, you know, and, but, I think there's a preoccupation with things that aren't going to help humanity. And I'm not really talking about America as much as I'm talking about the world. Yes. Yes. I, I mean, <laughs> the, Could public, you expound on that? The, public, the public discussion of uh, farming now in, in among um, leaders in the United States, um, particularly on the it is uninformed, shall we say? Um, British but people are so understated. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, un I, I, and I think misguided, because there is this uh, feeling, uh, and now I'm going to let some prejudices out, that uh, somehow those people who are left on the farm are really, you know, they really haven't known what they're doing, and either they are pretty dumb bumpkins, the kind of God made a farmer group, or else they're airy fairy agrarian Wendell Berry types, or else they're grasping big ag types. And none of those models, I mean, you know, those models are just inadequate to the 21st century as descriptions of people who are managing major enterprises with a lot of capital investment and and of course, if you go overseas, the whole problem is different. I'm just talking about America now. Okay, well, though I don't like to do it, let's stick with America for a second. <laughs> um, well, let's walk away from the farm and look after the farm. Let's go into the grocery store. Uh, are we, it doesn't seem as if we're eating better. I mean, there's a lot more knowledge than there used to be, and people talk about labels all the time, and you can get little frozen things in 100 calorie events, <laughs> and, but, is that adding up to better health and better nutrition for Americans, better 
understanding of our role in the food system? Well, it depends on you. I, I mean, I'm a historian. I mean, I go back 200 years quite happily. 150 years. Um, we're trying, we're in the middle of this enormous experiment. We're affluent. We have more food than we know what to do with. This is the first time it's happened in human history. Much of the time we're messing it up. Um, but it's going to take time to learn. If you go back, I mean, you know, peasant food was really dreadful. I mean, people, uh, nowadays people uh, think about, say, Italy, and they think, oh, well, they had these, you know, wonderful dishes conjured out of a few things. Most Italians couldn't afford pasta until well after World War II. They just didn't have the money to eat spaghetti. Uh, that was a Christmas treat. So, yes, I mean, we have lots more food. It's better quality food. It's safer food. We're not getting pellagra, and we're not getting beriberi, and uh, gastrointestinal diseases. I mean, you, you can go Except on. we're bringing raw milk back so that we can well, die. That, I way. mean, that's just... I grew up on raw milk, but we knew the cows. No, I mean, bring, <laughs> <laughs> bringing... <laughs> raw milk, raw milk is terrible. No, nobody should be drinking raw milk who doesn't have to. Um, I'm surrounded oh, we by raw drink milk. It. Farmers don't drink milk. At least not in England, they don't drink they, milk. Yeah, in the Hudson <laughs> Valley they do. Well, and it's getting to the yeah. point, I don't think I'm going to be able to vote in the primary next week unless I drink raw milk when oh, I go well. to the polling place. It's a little dictatorial. Well, we, but let's, let's move away from this um, rich and spoiled country for a second. We have exactly the opposite problem in the developing world. You know, a third of the world goes to bed having had too many calories. Many people go to bed without enough mm -hmm. access to them. And I find that the developed world's attitude to the developing world is condescending at best because their feeling is we, you know, if you would just have the nutrients, if you would just care about the basics, well, they care about the basics, but they're just trying to stay alive on the dollar a day that they have in sub-Saharan Africa with no water, too much sun, and no nutrients in the ground. How do we bridge that gap? Or should, I mean, how, what can we do, a, a world that has too much abundance, to also shift and realize that they have the opposite problem? Goodness, that's the question development people have been asking themselves for a long time. I, th I think it's actually one of the really dangerous things about affluence, that we just don't have a clue that that knowledge has been lost. And um, talking, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, telling people, you know, uh, the standard joke, you know, eat your rice, think of that poor starving child in wherever it happens to be. I mean, everybody figures that out quickly. Uh, and I don't think the Tony Bourdain kind of gastro-tourism um, is the answer to it either, because you don't fly into places and, and just um, kind of... Uh, film them and fly out again. So, no, I, I think it is a real, pro it's one of the things I, why I enjoyed teaching history. There's no, nothing better than teaching social history to, uh, maybe social history is the answer, because for me that was one of the ways into understanding that we live in, in a situation that's never happened before in the world. You mean in terms of our vast overabundance and our inability yeah, to mean, control Yeah, I mean, you know, Louis happened? XIV wouldn't have, you know, I mean, he'd have been as envious of what we could get in an American of Burger prison. King, yeah. Yeah, even at Burger King, I'm yeah. serious. Um, I am excited by teeny little inklings of progress in, the, in Africa where in Kenya and Uganda and various other places, they're planting GMO test plots, finally. Mm -hmm. It's a start. It's, you know, they're still ripping up golden rice all over the world. Um, should we not be focusing on that so much? 
should we just like walk away from the GMO issue and, and just admit defeat? GMOs are another thing that many people have been paying a lot of attention to, and I don't regard myself as a particular ex, I mean, I'm for GMOs, I'm not, that's not been what I've been working on. Um, I think we need GMOs in the rest of the world, I think, but I think we need all, you know, every tool in the toolbox is a sort of cliched answer. Um, we do. So I, yes, go for GMOs, but, uh, and, you know, everything else too. But, I mean, look, I mean, it, a lot of the world has pulled itself out of agrarian poverty in the last, since World War II. Sure. And so, um, it, I, being this optimist that Ted talks about, I'm optimistic that it can happen everywhere. I mean, I look at Mexico, where I spent many years, and the difference in standard of, Mexico's now a middle-class country for most people. It's 75% urban. And I agree with you, except for this thing about climate change, which sort of throws, I mean, both the speed at which we are growing the population of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. if we make it another 60 years, then there will be a demographic transition. Things will go down. It'll be beautiful. Mm -hmm. But we got to get there. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know how we get there with the uh, amount of food and the approach to food that we have in this world, in this country, or in any other. Not sure I can answer a global question no, about how we get there with the amount of food, except one can say whatever. I mean, I am constantly chided for being this naive technological optimist um, because it's much more sophisticated, I think, to be a pessimist, right? <laughs> um, you're asking me that? <laughs> I know, you're on the same side. <laughs> Well, we in Berkeley, <laughs> it's not, they're not pessimists, they're reactionaries. They're not pessimists. <laughs> they're people who believe that the magical past, which never existed, was somehow what it wasn't. And those, the old McDonald's farm, where your mother got up at five, did nothing but work on the farm, and died at the age of 47, those were the good old days. And farming then and now is the most dangerous profession that there mm -hmm. is. Um, so I don't think those people are pessimists or romantic. I think they're just reactionaries. But there's a lot of them out there, apparently. Not in this room. Uh, yes. So, but, yes. I, I, I don't like to give people labels like that. Um, and um, I, what do I say to, I mean, this, this is, we're getting so global. Come, um, yes. Do you, uh, let me ask you this then about the US. There are all these chains now, sweet greens, places where you can get healthy food, not crazily expensive, it's not as cheap as McDonald's, but it's, it's not overly high priced. Uh, there are quite a few of them in the big cities and they're spreading into smaller cities and you're not gonna find them in the rural areas mm -hmm. at the moment. Is that, is healthy fast food an answer? I mean, is fast food our destiny and if it is, should we just try to make it a bit better? I don't think fast food has to be bad. Oh gosh, there's a lot of things here. I, th I am very, um, I don't think the problem is the price of food. I think the problem is more the price of housing. Um, so it, if you're to deal with problems about food, you can't do it just within the food system. Um, I think that fast food has been around forever. Fast food can be perfectly healthy. Um, I think fast food has huge benefits. It's not the only, we need, but fine for fast food. If, if people think that quinoa is better than um, There's fast food oats, quinoa places. That, yeah, uh, well, fine, uh, and people can deliver it, that's good. Um, I am not an advocate of saying women 
should go back into the kitchen. We are, in fact, I think, in a golden age of home cooking, because now in home cooking, um, it's all the work's done for you. Home cooking now is just final assembly, basically. <laughs> And so you can finally assemble, and you've got these amazing grocery stores with everything you want. Um, but, and, and so that kind of home cooking is just fine. But home cooking where you're doing the kind of work my mother did, um, she would have loved to have my life. And it, it wasn't, it just was not an option. It, I mean, and she wasn't unusual. That was true of all. So any woman in this world, in this room, uh, should look at home cooking, and I'm sure they do, with a very skeptical eye, unless it is just this, you know, fun final assembly. And final assembly is fun because you can feed your family and they have a fun time. Um, so, I mean, that's actually that's one of the great tricks that's been pulled off what used to be a regarded as a laborious chore that anyone who could get out of it got out of it, um, <laughs> has been turned into something that is simultaneously moral and fun, which is a very <laughs> clever trick, right? Um, and so um, I wouldn't say that, I think, the wonderful thing at the moment is that there are all these ways to get food, um, and different ones are suitable for different people. Do you think many people have made the connection between housing and food prices? Because I think you're obviously right, but I don't, I don't believe that's how political um, thought is conducted in this country. I think it's coming, um, because uh, I'm seeing more and more articles on housing prices, and when I go to food banks and things and try to understand why in the richest country in the world people can't afford the, afford the cheapest food in the world, um, the answer always comes round to housing and also to medicine. We could start many questions with why in the richest country in the world people, <laughs> and, and then just end them in 57 <laughs> different ways, but I think Healthcare and housing are mm. two of the principal mm -hmm. issues. I think um, we'll end on that moral high note. Fun <laughs> and morality are never mixed, except <laughs> in your mind and in your writing. And I think it's exciting, and I agree with you, but I, I feel like, yes, we've, women and men too, have been liberated from something that they ought not to be enslaved by, but we are now suffering from our success, and we don't largely know how to deal with it. And that is a problem that is going to inflict more and more pain just in terms of healthcare costs, if nothing else. Yeah, well, you know, we are in this massive experiment, and um, there's not one single magic bullet that's going... I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a nasty shock isn't it? Because, you know, you thought once people became affluent and they had central heating and enough to eat and everything, you know, everything would get better. And in fact, uh, it turns out there's a whole bunch of new problems that come along with it. Well, since we've now solved all, all the food the problems problem. facing the world, <laughs> I just want to thank you and congratulate you on an award you do deserve. Oh, well, thank you so much. <laughs>